Yat eight or at no so, she a Zik or Janishinisha, she a Kiani, a Nishle Ado, Nakaidine, Bashishin, Yedine, Trachini, a Dashiche, Ado Honorani, Dashinel, a Moyatidi, Kehat Air, Do Chinli de Nasha, a Got Al, a Denenishle. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Zeke Argenis um, and my clans are the Tarian House clan and my uh, father's clan is of the Mexican clan. Uh, my grandfather's clan on my maternal side is of the red running into the water giant people and my, um, my grandfather's clan on my um, paternal side is of my, um, the one who walks around people. And today I will be presenting the traditional materials and tools that are going to be used in Navajo bead making. Uh, this is a lost art, it's a lost technique, not that many people are doing this form of tradition anymore. And I myself, I am trying to do my best to make sure that all of this uh, material and just knowledge gets passed down into the future generations. Um, so the first topic I'm going to be talking about is again about traditional materials. Uh, the first one I like to point out is the bead drill. In Navajo, we call this Yobe Bava Dada Kase, and that's the maker of beads. It's what we use. It's like our primitive Dremel tool, pretty much. And uh, this is a really like traditional, like well-known um, tool that had been used for thousands of years. Um, there are some people that I know who still use this, but only for minor drilling into like such as like tabs. Uh, for necklaces like this, but they don't do major drilling anymore for like making hishi. Now this thing has helped me throughout the many years that I have been bead making for I'd say about eight years I have been bead making and uh, I started in the third grade. Uh, the first item I used was actually a Dremel tool, which is a more modern uh, form of way of how you drill and bore holes into like any material. Um, until I got until about the, I'd say the eighth grade, that's when I actually took up the, the, drill, the pump drill. And uh, with this, I had actually made probably more than, I'd say a million beads. Uh, it is my favorite tool out of all of these, and it does help me um, with, with a lot of things for bead making. This totally differs from a Dremel tool because it's, you can control the speed as well as the weight of how you're drilling into the material you're using. Now, you do want to make sure that you don't press it too hard because you will risk cracking the bead. Now, another thing I like to do is I want to make sure that this stays sharpened. So, I'll use the file which we call Be Achuchisha, and then we'll make sure that we file that point down more so it won't get dull. And, because when you have it dull, you're just gonna let the drill top spin just blankly on that shell piece, which you don't wanna do. You wanna make sure you go all the way through, but what I like to do, this is an old drill bit. This is what I use a lot. This is a more common, like a more modern kind of drill bit. Um, next I'll go and drill the other side, but this is a more modern drill bit, meaning that it's made out of a nail. Now, if you want to get really into the ancient days, what they would use is a crystal, which we call rock crystal. And what they would do is that they would split or break apart that rock crystal and find the fragments. I might have drilled a little bit to the side, but that's fine. Um, they would have sorted out the splints of that rock crystal and attached it, maybe modify it to make it more into a point and then they would use that as a drill bit. But until the Spanish got here, as well as when trading posts started coming out and all these nails started to be a more common thing, they replaced that whatever obsidian or rock crystal for a more modern drill bit. So they modified a nail which I use and you want to make sure you keep it sharpened every time and that's what they even used was the nail um, and this is a more older drill bit meaning that it's starting to kind of get shorter than it should be see how fast I can go now because I uh, 
straightened up that tape that was holding it in place. Now you can go any speed really. You can go any speed you want, but I like to go fast usually. But when I'm closer to that hole where the other hole meets the other side, I want to make sure I go slower. So I can still go fast, but you hear that squeaking where it stops? That's where you're going to stop. And the only thing you can tell really from if a bead is pump drilled is that if you looked, if it has a bowl formation inside that drill hole. And that's what I like about when I ask a person or when they come to me and say, is this an old style like pump drill necklace? And the first thing, if I'm far away from them, the first thing I ask is, can you take a picture of the inside of the bead? So the difference from a pump drill bead, and this is a more modern made bead, is that you can see that there's no bowl shape formation where the, the drill had met. The, whatever tool they were, uh, I was using, such as the Dremel tool, it went straight through the bead, so I didn't make any like bowl formation, it just went straight through it. And it's a more finer tune to it. And the next tool I like to point out are these rasps or files. We call that bear achit kissen, and that's how we say it in Navajo. Uh, we call them files. And uh, this is technically a rasp because it's more f like, um, I'd say, it has a more a uh, rougher kind of surface. So this is the tool that I use for when I start off when I'm carving uh, items such as fetishes. When I have that big hunk of rock, I'll use this item first, the rasps, because it knocks out most of that rock out. Now, when I go to a more finer um, kind of like filing, I go to this more finer file. This is what I use for when I want to do a little bit of touch-ups, but not to the point where it's like finalizing the item. Uh, really what finalizes the items are more finer grit uh, materials, which are these mini files that we have. And these are like, uh, these materials right here, they're all more modern, but in the old days they did have rasp. I would say probably when the 1800s they did have rasp up until like the, you know, the 1900s. That's when uh, rasp started coming into uh, the many homes of bead makers, Pueblo and Navajo alike, but these more uh, finer kind of grit ra uh, files, they're diamond based, so they have a diamond grit to them, and I use these for like touch-ups and such. Uh, this is what I use for carving out my animals and my, um, you know, just tabs and such. Now, if you want to get to grinding into beads, I use these, what were we call, and that's what we call these, which were called whetstones. Um, these, this is what helps me with my bead making. What I do is I'll take a strand of beads, and usually how this starts off, it's, it's, it's pretty much more rough, and it's not as fine as this kind of hishi that I have rolled out. Now, what I'll do is I'll add water to the surface of the whetstone. Now, this is a monster whetstone that I like to call. Uh, this helps me knock out most of my longer beads. So I probably have beads that are probably like 16 inches long or so that are just raw uh, chips of shell or turquoise, whatever I'm using. And I'll apply water to here and I'll roll my hand like this. And I'll keep rolling it and rolling it and rolling it and I'll pull the string while I roll it. And that's how I make my beads uh, that way. There's also a more modern way of making beads. Uh, people like to use like cabbing machines, those really like really expensive machines that they use for like getting like really fine touch-ups on like stones and shells and such. Um, I do have a cabbing machine. I usually use them when I'm like in a rush for like a jewelry item or such, like a custom order. But usually my jewelry comes in with the old making way, so I like to use this, these big whetstones. And these I like to call that means like the little, the smaller kind of whetstone. And I call these also palm grinders, so when I'm making large tabs, like turquoise tabs, I will take the tab and then I'll apply water to it. You always want to use water when you're, if you're grinding, so that's a big key into part of bean making is using a lot of water. So I'll take the tab and then I'll come running it around, uh, running it around with this uh, smitty whetstone, and then I'll make sure I get those edges kind of crisp. Because when I break the stone, I use hammers, I use cheap shears, 
And I also use these pliers, which I like to point out, they have this teeth, these teeth right here, these really straight teeth. And I like to use those because you can chip the rock out in the shell. And that's how I start off making my shells and beads is by crushing it, by you know breaking it in some form of way. Um, so with these teeth on here, whenever I have a shell, I usually like snap it or break it off. And usually when I have other shells that have spines on it, like spiny oyster, I use these pliers to snip those off. Um, for these, these are like kind of what I used to carve almost. This is really for when I have a big like hunk of rock and I want to split it in half, I'll use the hammer. I'll take the hammer and I'll put at the point of the rock where I want to split in half. And it'll take a couple of tries depending on how hard the rock is. Um, and of course this is really dull from the many years I have split the rocks with. So, you know, just common items that the ancestors had from like the 1800s up until now. Um, it is what they would find such as like trading posts and such if they had like discarded um, like you know pieces of materials or tools they would use those and use them in some way for their uh, jewelry making ways um, another item I like to point out is this piece of wood I have right here this is what I use for bead making now I could use the pump drill on a surface a hard surface like this the problem is is when you're bead making the shell or whatever material you're using the, the drill the hole through, once you finally drill all the way through that material, it's going to hit that hard surface and it's probably going to split the bead in half. And that's kind of a problem for me sometimes. Like I'll get like sometimes lazy and I'll use this rather than finding a piece of wood. Now pieces of wood, they use this a lot for bead making because it has a more so softer kind of surface. So when you're drilling through, you can have that nice, and you always, it's always in the fill when you're drilling. You have, to, you have to know that fill when you're about to get to the end of the bead that when you're drilling through. So it does, you have all these marks in here, which is a good thing because it cushions the bead. Now, uh, another item I like to point out is these sandpaper, these really, really rough sandpaper grits. Um, I like to use these for sometimes like tabs, like when I'm making tab beads, uh, you get to, you know, kind of grind those out. And when you have like really large scratch marks, you can use this to kind of even it out, but you will also want to use a more finer sandpaper because you again still have those scratch marks. So having different kinds of sandpaper is also key to the, like or how rough you want your bead and how smooth you want it. Um, another thing I like to point out, are these sheep shears again. So this is also what I use for chipping beads. Um, I don't use it for like, like cutting anything. I just use it for like when I just break off the rock or the shell. I usually use this for shell, but I noti notice a lot of the old pictures of some of the bead makers, they'll be having like a horse, horse, hoo horse hoof uh, nippers. And those horse hoof nippers were like a real like big deal back then for making beads because these can chip beads like shells and such, but the horse hoof nippers actually got the job done for like splitting things in half and such. Um, another thing I like to point out is these pieces of leather. These pieces of leather are a key to polishing as well as if you want to cushion the bead, like let's say if you have, if you're doing grinding on sandstone or you're drilling through sandstone, you use this as a cushion, but this is what I use for polishing my beads. This is an old style way of how we polish beads. Now people have buffing wheels nowadays, which is a big deal nowadays, but the leather that we have was a big deal. <laughs> it was like our like buffing wheel back then. And we would sometimes use um, like sheep's fat. We would use sheep's fat to apply to the leather. It could be sheep leather, it can be elk leather. This is deer leather. Now they would apply that fat to it and they would start to polish the bead with it. And you have to, it's really painstaking, but eventually you will notice when it starts having that, that mirror finish to it, to the bead. Um, finally, I have these pieces of yarn. This is factory made yarn. Now I also spin my own yarn. I didn't bring a spindle today, which I'm really sad about, but 
These are all factory spun yarns. And I use these sometimes for stringing, but I really caution myself because a, a lot of the old necklaces, they do have like a, like a cotton based string that is strung through the bead. Now, that's more weaker compared to the sinew. The sinew is the place where I go to and string my beads. Uh, sinew has a more like stronger and more, it lasts longer than the, the cotton itself because the cotton itself can wear out over years like faster than the sinew. So, but I like to use these pieces of um, yarn right here, the, this cotton thread for finishing off my necklaces. And um, yeah, so thank you. Yeah.